All right. So welcome, everybody. I'm so excited to have you here. There is new information on our website about two new and upcoming events. If you haven't seen it yet, the Westwood Fundraiser Auction. Um, there's information about how to donate and how to look at the catalog of things online. It, it, these are all online events. Um, and there's an opportunity to join a sing-along in February. Information is always on our website. And if you'd like to join up for the sing-along in February, um, you need to pre-register because they're going to send you the music by email. So you have it in front of you to be able to sing. So you'll find that at westwoodunitarian.ca. Now our opening song is played by um, one of our many beloved musicians, Steve Bell, and it is entitled Gather the Spirit. And so we invite you to stay muted, but sing along the words will appear on the screen. this time we pause to affirm that the land where we gather has borne witness to thousands of years of indigenous history, culture, 
and spirituality and continues to do so, providing a rich and fertile context as we gather together this morning. Westwood's building is located on Treaty 6 in Edmonton, Alberta, along with many of us who are Zooming in this morning. As Unitarian Universalists, our second principle is justice, equity, and compassion in human relations, which I believe is an important part of reconciliation. I acknowledge my role as a treaty person and feel called to explore what that means and how to be a respectful and responsible ally. Welcome to Westwood Unitarian, a Unitarian Universalist community where our search for spirituality and our passion for justice meet and mingle. Unitarian Universalism is defined as a liberal religion characterized by a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. At Westwood Unitarian, music is an expression of our joy, worship a sign of our faith, and acts of justice a symbol of our hope. My name is Heather McLean Smith, and my pronouns are she and her. It is my honor to be your service leader this morning. Our guest speaker today is our very own Reverend Ann Barker. I extend a thank you to Alara Stefan Gadet and Bill Lee for their tech support, as well as Steve Bell and Rebecca Patterson, along with our guest musician, Lynn Harrison, for their beautiful contribution of music. On behalf of the congregation, I bid a special welcome to those of you who have found us while we are online. We all long to be together again, and we are especially looking forward to meeting you. Westwood continues to build connections in ways we weren't expecting, and we all are all being stretched in new ways. Westwood is fully online within weeks of, um, we never missed a beat, we were always online, which I'm really, really proud of. And with this push of the COVID, um, it has elevated us in new ways that I never thought were possible before. And that is definitely something to celebrate. If you have a candle or a chalice handy, now's the time to bring it forward. And I'll light one here as well for all of us. We find that lighting chalices or candles together brings us all into a similar action. And Heather's modeling what our worship committee does. When we don't have a candle nearby, we put our hands up and we be the flame. And sometimes we giggle because it's silly, but we love it because we're together. Our chalice lighting poem this morning is by the Sufi poet Rumi as translated by Coleman Barks, which may or may not be accurate, but the words are beautiful. It is entitled The Guest House. This being human is a guest house. Every morning, a new arrival, a joy, a depression, a meanness, some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all, even if they're a crowd of sorrows who violently sweep your house empty of its furniture. Still, treat each guest honorably. He may be clearing you out for some new delight. The dark thought, the shame, the malice, meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. Be grateful for whoever comes because each has been sent as a guide from the beyond. The words of Rumi. We light our chalice in a spirit of openness and vulnerability. The lighting of candles of concern and celebration is a cherished and beloved tradition at Westwood, along with many other Unitarian Universalist congregations across the country and around the world. It continues to be a vital part of our time together and maybe even more so as we continue to navigate our lives through this pandemic. I invite you to type your messages into the chat as we listen to this beautiful composition of Icebreaker played by Steve Bell. 
Thank you everyone for your sharing. I would like to, um, in, this, in this spirit, because I don't have a candle, I would like to spiritually light a last candle for all of the joys and concerns spoken and unspoken that remain in our hearts. I invite you now to recite our affirmation in your screen in front of you. May the light of these candles inspire us to use our power to heal and not to harm, to help and not to hinder, to serve the spirit of truth in loving affection and trusting hope. Westwood is a self-sufficient community sustained and maintained by donations from members and friends. In a moment, we are going to play a video about one of the upcoming events at Westwood. Hi, I'm Lorian Kennedy, and I'm part of the team preparing our latest Westwood fundraiser auction. We really need your help with the auction this year. As you know, our building is closed, so we have no rental income. But as you can see, we are still up and running, and we're offering many ways for you to stay connected and supported. 
This year, our auction is going to be different. It's all online and running as a silent auction over 10 days from February 18th to 28th. I know I'm going to miss mixing with everybody in person, but it's really going to be fun and people this way can participate from any location. We'll wrap up with a happy hour Zoom from 4 to 6 on Sunday, February 28th. We'll have some wonderful entertainment and we'll be able to watch the final bids coming in. If you go to our main Westwood website, westwoodunitarian.ca, you can find out how to donate items and services and events, how to view the catalog of items. Uh, you don't need to register for that. And then how to register if you want to bid. So this year donors will keep their, their items at home and we'll help people connect at the end to pick up their items. Donations are welcome right now. You can get them sent in, just send in pictures and descriptions. Look on our website to find out how to do that. If you have questions, email us at auction at westwoodunitarian.ca. Bidding starts February 18th. You'll be notified if someone outbids you so you have a chance to respond. And if you wish, you can download an app for the auction website. So we're going to have some interesting items. We already have an apple from the Garden of Eden. So please spread the word. I can't wait to see what's in the catalog this year. There are many ways to donate to Westwood, including by volunteering time, sharing your talent, or by donating financially. E-transfers can be made to West, info at westwoodunitarian.ca. Now let's feel free to sing along while muted to Rebecca and our offertory song. From you I receive, to you I give, together we share, and from this we live, together I receive. Vulnerability. I racked my brain for an image to represent today's service and settled on these snowflakes that you see on the slide. Vulnerability. We humans say how every snowflake is different, no two alike, just like people. And when you see them set alone like this on a wooden background, looks like somebody's deck maybe, they are absolutely beautiful. The one front and center is delicate. All those fragile little pieces looks like it could be a frosty fern-like skeleton for a hexagon. And the one behind it, more substantial, tougher, loaded up with ice and frost, each with their own story of falling from the sky to earth. They wouldn't exist if they didn't fall. And yet falling means that they are vulnerable to the stompy boots of wintry children, to animals that lick them up on evening walks, to the warming sun of the afternoon or to the crushing weight of the next blizzard. Alone on a deck like these two, their time will be short, but their beauty is magnificent. And they have brought joy to so many people who have shared this image posted for free on the Unsplash website by the photographer Maddie Baker. Thank you, Maddie. Our theme this month is vulnerability, part of an overarching annual theme of forward motion. We knew when we chose it that January would be tough. To be fair, January is frequently a tough month for people. The festive decorations and lights come down, well, not everywhere, you should see our house, but most places. And the bills come in, resolutions might be broken and people feel disappointed in themselves again. The days sh are short, the nights are long and winter hauls out her best displays. Now we have been fortunate, it hasn't been too cold and snowy yet here in Edmonton, but that appears to be changing now. January's traditionally, a month where people struggle 
and the cold and the dark settle in. And this January, we have reached an anniversary when for most of us, COVID began to seem real. Our shutdowns started here in March, but by January, we knew we were in trouble, that it was likely coming. There was a lot of uncertainty, but it wasn't quite real for us yet. Now this January, in the midst of it all, there's still uncertainty. We can see hopefully that there is a light at the end of the tunnel, but the tunnel is long. This is 10 months now, and there are at least another eight predicted for us here in Edmonton before all the folks in Alberta will be vaccinated. And we don't know what that means. We don't know how we will feel or what changes will be secure. So stronger than these snowflakes, we're still vulnerable. Now, before I get into the heart of the sermon, let's pause for a musical guest. This is Lynn Harrison, a UU community minister in Toronto who specializes in a music ministry called The Well, and it, of course, has also been interrupted um, by COVID, and so she has found new ways to share her music with people. Lynn posted this song on YouTube last August. Her name again is Lynn Harrison, if you want to look her up and see some of the other things she's done. It spoke to me then. You'll see that the one political line is of a different time, but that's just more cheerful now. I trust that it will speak to you now as well. You ask me how I'm doing and I say, fine, not fine. Just a little blue and seeking some peace of mind as I'm searching through the ruins for the reasons and rhyme. Ask me how I'm doing fine, not fine. Well, how am I this morning? Well, I'm well, not well. Another day of mornings coming, far as I can tell, with that madman across the border and no safe place to dwell. How am I this morning? Well, not well. Yes, I'm fine, not fine. Okay, I guess Trying to find a way to navigate this blessed mess Yes, I'm fine, not fine Considering present circumstances and the state of everything As I'm looking in the mirror and I look good, not good Each day it's coming clearer I've not done all I could to dismantle all the fences that make up this neighborhood. Lately, things have not been looking good. Yes, I'm fine, not fine. Getting through, finally realizing just how much there is to do. Yes, I'm fine, not fine. Considering present circumstances and the state everything. You ask me how I'm feeling and I say fine not fine. The hurting and the healing happen to be intertwined and my life is more worth living when I hold your hand in mine. So come with me and we'll be fine not fine. We'll be fine not fine. Okay I guess. Try to this blessed mess will be fine, not fine. Considering present circumstances and the state of everything. Present circumstances and the state of everything. Yay, Lynn Harrison. We tend to think about vulnerability as frailty or an inability to take care of oneself, like the term vulnerable populations, people for whom being at risk is a constant state of being. Or as illness, like having a depressed immune system makes you more vulnerable to disease or more likely to have severe effects. 
but vulnerability has a bad rap. We think of it as something to avoid. To be vulnerable means to be at risk. To make the choice to be vulnerable is to put yourself at risk, physically and emotionally. Without some vulnerability, life would be empty. Now, Brene Brown is a contemporary expert on vulnerability. And here's what she discovered when surveying leaders about brave leadership and courage in the book, Dare to Lead. As much time as I spend trying to understand the why, I spend 10 times as much researching, or the way, sorry. Let me start again. As much time as I spend trying to understand the way, I spend 10 times as much researching what gets in the way. For example, I didn't set out to study shame. I wanted to understand connection and empathy. But if you don't understand how shame can unravel connection in a split second, you don't really get connection. I didn't set out to study vulnerability. It just happened to be the big barrier to almost everything we want from our lives, especially courage. As Marcus Aurelius taught us, what stands in the way becomes the way. Studying brave leadership, here are some of the top behaviors and issues that Brown found were getting in the way of organizations. I've edited it down, there were 10. This is just the, the um, top notes of six. Avoiding tough conversations. Spending more time managing problematic behaviors than proactively acknowledging and addressing fears and feelings. Diminishing trust due to a lack of connection and empathy. Not taking smart risks and sharing bold ideas for fear of being put down. Opting out of vital conversations for fear of looking wrong. Perfectionism and fear keeping people from learning and growing. All of these and more are tied to the difficulties we have around choosing to be vulnerable. It's true in all organizations, businesses, as well as congregations, as well as personal relationships like marriages or families or friends, parenting. Nobody wants to look foolish or wrong. We've been trained culturally in perfectionism and it's hard to put that down. We don't wanna feel embarrassed or worse, ashamed. And that separates us. It's the instant path to disconnection. But without taking a chance, being vulnerable, we won't learn or grow or heal or be connected. Brown defines vulnerability as the courage to be imperfect. The courage to be imperfect. She says that the courage to be vulnerable is not about winning or losing. It's about the courage to show up when you can't predict or control the outcome. Since COVID arrived, I have been hanging on tight to the mantra that we are practicing compassionate imperfection. I say it at least six times a day, if only inside my head, but often out loud. The sudden need to close the Westwood building put us at risk of disconnection. We were vulnerable and it was just thrust upon us. We didn't pick it. It just arrived and our vulnerability was that we had just lost our primary way of gathering in person in the building. We needed to find a bold new method, bold because we had no idea what we were doing and we needed to do it fast. We didn't have time to worry about making fools of ourselves. We didn't have the option of perfectionism because we weren't equipped for even average. So we just forged ahead because connection mattered to us more than foolishness. For years, people have been pondering in congregations and organizations about accessibility and outreach using online methods. 
but only the bravest and often the largest and the most financially endowed congregations have made moves in that direction. Likely because they could hire consultants and experts and had grander visions of the future. Now, speaking only for myself, the idea was overwhelming. Figuring out the tech, learning to speak on camera rather than in a medium that disappeared as soon as words were delivered, trying to figure out how to have interaction when everybody else is muted and we're not in the same place. Hearing your voices and your responses is so important to me. How do we interact and not just be some kind of static performance? These things were so intimidating in all of the ways that Brown discovered that organizations hold themselves back. But with COVID, we didn't have a choice to be vulnerable. We landed in it. In the crisis, we plowed ahead. Still, we could have chosen not to participate. Some small churches have just closed up. Or a great alternative, they've joined with larger groups for the time that we're online and will go back to meeting in their buildings when they can. They're waiting for when things go back to normal. But I don't think things are going to go back to normal. I think we're going to have new hybrid versions. How would we possibly leave behind all the people who join us from away? If you can't drive to Westwood on Sunday morning, I'm not leaving you out in the cold. I don't know how to bring you in yet, but we'll figure that out together. Being vulnerable and choosing to engage are not automatically the same thing. This is what I was focused on when I entitled this service, A Willing Spirit. What we did choose was to show up even when we couldn't control the outcome. We were all a bit fragile. So we were super careful with one another. There's that compassion and empathy piece. People shared ideas and tools and tips. I have never seen ministers collaborate the way we have through COVID or congregations. We didn't worry about looking foolish. We simply tried things and we tried other things if it didn't turn out the way we wanted, mostly because there was no other option. We even chose to increase our vulnerability by making use of resources like Bowden's Video Ministry Academy, which terrified me completely, because it was more important to get help than it was to be held back by our insecurities. All the videos you see in services like Lorian this morning are Westwood members and friends bravely trying new things. I can look at a video that I did and think, oh, my eyes are in the wrong place. Or I look nervous. Or the lighting could be better. But that's where compassionate imperfection comes in. Compassionate imperfection is the culture and the environment that we're building that makes room for people to try, to learn, and to grow. This is the culture that will not change just because COVID is no longer a threat. So let's pause a minute and reflect on this time, these 10 months since COVID has closed the building and the 12 months that it has really been in our consciousness and think about the ways our lives have changed. Now, there will be things that have been imposed on you, like public health restrictions or changes to work or school or family or social life, interruptions, disruptions, breaks. We've all experienced losses to one degree or another, things that are tough and some that are heartbreaking. And maybe because of those things and sometimes in spite of those things, you've had to learn something new or take some chances. And maybe it's easier to think, to start by thinking about a loved one's courage 
or a neighbor or a local business that you saw trying something new. We're gonna rest in quiet for a minute while you think about some way that you or someone that you see has risked being vulnerable, not just found themselves vulnerable, but chosen to try something in that moment of vulnerability. When you've taken a chance of looking foolish or letting your ignorance show when you tried something that was new or intimidating or hard for you. These are examples of a willing spirit. That's the title of our service this morning, a willing spirit. And when you're ready, you can type those things into the chat. I'll read some of them aloud as best I can without names. What is something that you or someone you see taken a chance trying since our world has changed, big or small. Okay, here we go. Connecting more deeply with immediate neighbors. Wow, neighbors have been really important. Regular Zoom calls with siblings. When I've driven Harry to get groceries, do business, or get eyelashes for his daughter. Zoom chats with all my siblings in different places. Driveway socials with neighbors. Arranging weekly family Zoom chats and not being very tech savvy doing live videos for children and starting a Patreon to feel more grounded in my art. Starting a book club with women I love who live far away. Deliberately setting up one-on-one -on -one friendship calls and walks. Recognizing who is alone and isolated and offering company and help with chores working online and learning that it can work well. How many things did we think we couldn't do from home that we can do from home, hey? I have started writing again after a long pause, tried my green thumb and can hear my beloved mother's voice in my heart and I've become even closer with a couple of friends. Build your own fun, make your own adventure with my wonderful wife. Taking part in an online Tai Chi course, a wonderful gift. How many of you have never ever been on Zoom until this happened? Right? I remember that first week, the crush of helping people figure out how to get on Zoom and watching how family relationships have changed because now we can see our families in ways that even if they're in the same town in ways we didn't see before. Having more time to work through important family dynamics, amen. Found a new hobby, volunteer service that I can do from home. Awesome. Many of you were people who didn't cook before this happened and had to learn to cook or tried new things. I think of how many of you led a summer service online when we didn't know which end was up or were the tech for a summer service or have been an online service leader, which is exactly the same and completely different to being a service leader in the church building. Meeting new friends and getting closer with old ones by playing games online. My kids and their Many siblings get together on all the birthdays and events and play games together. Applied for an advocacy position with the city that is close to my heart. I've heard lots of people talk about how this time at home, this change in our patterns, the less traveling and driving around has given them more time to focus on what really matters to them and what they really need. How many of you trimmed your own hair? Sent snail mail again. 
or made phone calls. You know, we were in a culture of don't phone people, that's just rude. And now we're in a culture of you didn't phone people, that's just rude. Some of you volunteered for the Westwood phone tree to call people you might not even have known. Doing videos for the services. A 40 minute Zoom chat with my great nephew in England about a book we both loved. Going to the pastiche once a week. Writing political letters for social justice. Getting some not so tech savvy friends to play games with us. I got married anyways. Who actually needs a dress and a party and I do's all in the same day during a pandemic? Wedding photos this year and a party one day once it's safe. We've adapted so many rituals to be able to do them in new ways, rites of passage and rituals in our lives because they didn't stop being important. We didn't stop needing what we need. We're just changing the way we're doing it. I'm gonna start um, speaking again, but if you think of something and you wanna add it, feel free. There's, uh, there's no time limit on good ideas. C.S. Lewis wrote, to love at all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will certainly be wrung and possibly broken. If you wanna make sure of keeping it intact, you must give your heart to no one, not even to an animal. Wrap it carefully around with hobbies and little luxuries, avoid all entanglements, lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken, it will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. I would argue that it's not just selfishness. Sometimes it's just fear or tenderness or injuries that have held us back from before. But loving anything makes us vulnerable. Showing up in new places makes us vulnerable. To love is to be vulnerable. Brene Brown talks about three methods of avoiding vulnerability. Striving for perfection, numbing out or avoidance, or disrupting joyful moments by dress rehearsing tragedy and imagining all the ways that a thing could go wrong. Do any of these sound familiar or fit for you? I might have an intimate relationship with two or three of them. Maybe you have another way that you avoid vulnerability or taking risks. How do you avoid vulnerability? How do you put off taking the risks that might otherwise feed you with love and connection and new ideas and new hopes and growth and possibility? It might help to think back to those ways that organizations get themselves in trouble. Here's the shorter version, avoiding tough conversations, not proactively acknowledging or addressing fears or feelings, diminishing trust due to a lack of compassion or empathy, fear of being put down, fear of looking wrong, perfectionism and fear keeping people from learning and growing. How do you avoid vulnerability? If you'd like to share in the chat, you're invited to do that, but don't feel pressured. I don't want to force you to be vulnerable in the vulnerability question. I've spoken about Brene Brown today, but there are many people who not only speak about vulnerability and courage, but who live it. Some quite boldly, others quietly in the background who just keep things moving along. I think about justice and faith healers who risk their lives to take a stand, even knowing that they will face angry resistance and often danger, even knowing that they might never see a fruitful outcome from their efforts in their lifetime. All the protesters who march for Black lives, for Idle No More, 
for missing and murdered indigenous women and girls, pride marches, Greenpeace actions, pipeline protests, and people who risk love after loss, after heartache. Who are your exemplars of courage and vulnerability and how have they inspired you? They might be famous or family or someone who provides a service in your life. They could even be fictional, but inspiring. I'm going to read one more Brene Brown quote and then share a story or two with you while you populate the chat feed with the answer to that question. Who are your exemplars of courage and vulnerability? Who demonstrates courage and vulnerability in a way that speaks to you or that you admire? And how have they inspired you? Brene Brown says, if we are brave enough, often enough, we will fail. Daring is not saying I'm willing to risk failure. Daring is saying I know that I eventually will fail and I'm still all in. I've never met a brave person who hasn't known disappointment, failure, and even heartbreak. One of my exemplars of vulnerability is Maya Angelou, the poet Maya Angelou. She wrote this beautiful book, the first of many called, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings. And it was the story of her life, the early part of her life. There's a whole series. And this wild awakening I had when I read her book was that she described her life story and what we might call her flaws or her failings with no explanation and no apology. She just told the story. She risked that people would think poorly of her. How many times have I not done something or said something because I worry about what people might think of me? And for her to write and tell her life story without hesitation, just told the story. That changed my life forever, reading that. That realization that you don't have to apologize for the mistakes that you've made or the behaviors that you wouldn't choose now. I mean, I'm not saying we don't sometimes have healing to do. But when you're telling a story, whether or not the people like you on the other side really isn't your business. Just being brave enough to tell the story. I'm going to look in the chat and see what's happening in here. So many people have told me how capable I appear. Often I have just taken a breath and done my best while quaking on the inside. Isn't that so true? Those people that we see as brave and courageous, they just took one more step or took a breath and carried on. I just realized, oh, how I avoid or minimize interactions with in-laws under the guise, at least some of the time of setting boundaries, right? How setting boundaries can be helpful, but it might be a way out. I think President Joe Biden shows vulnerability. Amen to that. I admire people who ask basic questions at risk of sounding dumb or revealing ignorance. Yeah, we always say that there are no foolish questions and yet we feel foolish when we ask a question. And sometimes that holds us back. And that's what compassionate imperfection is about is about really having a culture that backs that up. Women from places like Powapan, I'm sorry if I got that pronunciation wrong, Powapan Women's Center LaRange, those who stand for climate change in ways like trying to stop pipelines, peat mining, so many justice issues, those who stand with Indigenous people in so many ways to decolonize this country and world. Avery is one of the people who I look up to for their radical vulnerability. Also Brene Brown. 
I avoid vulnerability by being more willing to change than to hold some of the deeper parts of myself aloud, but less and less as time passes. Mm. My transgender friends who bring their authentic selves to the world, despite the judgment, hatred, and even danger they know they are certain to face just by existing. Amen. Hey, people. I'm so grateful for every uh, Westwood member or friend who showed up when we had a um, had workshops about trans identity and the use of pronouns because you have to risk people seeing what you don't know so that you can learn. And all the people who are showing up right now for Miranda Jimmy's workshop, because we have to risk looking at the hard parts in our existence and our responsibility to the culture, even when we might not want to. My inspirations are my daughter and her partner who always stand up and fight for their beliefs, even when it puts them at risk. They also will act as the voice for those that can't speak or advocate for themselves. So true. I have one more story I'll tell you about this. And that's uh, many of you are on the Facebook group, the UU Hysterical Society. My friend Liz James started it. There's thousands and thousands of people on there. Now it's a UU comedy center. And Kathy Smith is um, the moderator of that group, the primary moderator of that group. She's a religious educator from the US. And we've just come to recognize in our latest board meeting that she is not a moderator in that group. She is a religious educator. Because if I was the moderator of that group, when somebody acts out or says something offensive, I'd say, okay, to be fair, you know, cause it's a lot of work. I would just kind of boot them out. There are rules. There are clearly stated rules for behavior. If you break these rules, you don't get to be here. Kathy spends hours every day educating people on what inclusion and openness mean. She doesn't avoid conflict, she wades into it. She has so much patience and probably frustration and courage and she is consistent and faithful. And she just keeps explaining over and over again that in a Unitarian Universalist in space, inclusion matters and the impacts of your words and actions matter. And when somebody makes what we would think of as a mistake, says something that we have left behind historically, she will just explain how that happened, what the change is needed, and the conversation stays up. When she makes a mistake, the conversation stays up so that the learning is there for everyone who reads it. Her willingness to be vulnerable and to faithfully wade into conflict, that's something I really admire in a human. There's one more in the chat. I admire my friend Roya. She had a stillbirth eight years ago and she's due again in four weeks. She is brave and bold, but also very vulnerable when she writes and speaks. I admire her strength and courage. Ooh. So let's all take a moment and just hold Roya in our thoughts, our prayers, our meditations, whatever it is that speaks to you. Let's just be there in her pocket. We can't make pain go away, but we can accompany one another through it. I avoid the vulnerability that comes with sharing my thoughts by telling myself, I'm leaving space for others to speak. Way to go, that's a great one. <laughs> I've used that one myself. Even in a chat like this one, when there is enough space for everyone. Yeah, thanks for that one. Thanks for all of them. Thank you all for your vulnerability. Just showing up, just being here with us. 
I'm going to close the service, um, the sermon part of the service here. We have another song and, and chalice extinguishing, but I'm going to close the sermon, of course, with the words of Brene Brown. Now, these are the closing words of her TEDx talk entitled The Power of Vulnerability. And I want to say it was um, filmed in 2010, June 2010. There have been 51,674,912 viewings of that TED Talk. I highly recommend it, The Power of Vulnerability. Except that there are more views than that because in the four hours that I was transcribing words from it and focusing on it in, the, in part of the preparation for this service, it increased by over 1,200 views. Four hours. The power of vulnerability. To let ourselves be seen, deeply seen, vulnerably seen. To love with our whole hearts, even though there's no guarantee. And that's really hard. And I can tell you as a parent, that's excruciatingly difficult. To practice gratitude and joy in those moments of terror when you're wondering, can I love you this much? Can I believe in this, this passionately? Can I be this fierce about this? Just to be able to stop and instead of catastrophizing what might happen to say, I'm just so grateful because to feel this vulnerable means I'm alive. And the last, which I think is probably the most important, is to believe that we're enough. Because when we work from a place, I believe, that says, I'm enough, then we stop screaming and start listening. We're kinder and gentler to the people around us. And we're kinder and gentler to ourselves. The words of Brene Brown. Blessed be, and amen. Oh, thank you, Anne, for that lovely sermon and very powerful exercise. Uh, I invite you now to sing along for our last hymn, Well Muted, because we're still on Zoom. It's uh, played by Steve Bell, and it's called Sing Out Praises for the Journey.
deep gratitude for all of our musicians who went from playing piano in our little church building while we sang along robustly to performing alone in a room. And many of them are performers, but not necessarily solo performers and how they have bravely recorded their voice and their playing and sent it to us week after week so that we could sing along with our rusty little voices at the top of our lungs in our houses. It just brings me so much gratitude and joy. I'm gonna bring my chalice forward. These are the chalice extinguishing words and edited shorter version of how I closed the sermon from the power of vulnerability. To let ourselves be seen, deeply seen, vulnerably seen, to love with our whole hearts, even though there's no guarantee, to practice gratitude and joy in those moments of terror, just to be able to stop and to say, I'm just so grateful because to feel this vulnerable means I'm alive. And the most important, to believe that we're enough. Because when we work from a place that says, I'm enough, we're kinder and gentler to the people around us. And we're kinder and gentler to ourselves. May you be filled with loving kindness, which follows the vulnerable courage of allowing yourself to be seen. So we extinguish the flame, but we carry the message and the love and the joy in our hearts. Now it's time for a coffee and conversation. Of course, it's bring your own coffee. If you want to reach us outside of Sunday service, just send a message to Westwood Unitarian or to minister at westwoodunitarian.ca or info at westwoodunitarian.ca if you have a question or you want to connect with someone and you don't know how. If you can't find them on our website, which is the fountain of all information, um, connect through info at westwoodunitarian.ca or minister at westwoodunitarian.ca. Can we lift up our service next week? Would you please lift up our service next week? Our next, our service next week is Miranda Jimmy, who is coming to speak. She works with Rise Edmonton, which is the um, Reconciliation and Solidarity Edmonton. They're a fabulous Truth and Reconciliation group, and she is coming to speak with speak to us.